Real estate is about freedom, choice freedom, time freedom, and money freedom, and the impact you can make with that freedom. But it doesn't come without cost. Your freedom takes work. That's why Neil Timmons brings together the tools you need to build your real estate legacy, from tips and tricks to interviews with industry titans. It's all here in one place. Real Grit. Let's get to it. Everybody, welcome to Real Grit. I'm Neil Timmons, your host. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to have John Dwyer here. Let me tell you a little about him. He launched his financial career in Minneapolis in 2005. He began working closely with with dental students at the University of Minnesota Dental School. That's where his wife was in school at the time. His father-in-law was a practicing dentist. John quickly realized the unique needs of the dental profession and found his niche working with those in the dental and medical fields. And upon moving back to Bismarck, John founded Solid Rock Financial Group in order to help medical and dental professionals, business owners, and real estate professionals in areas of disability insurance, wealth accumulation, and estate planning with an emphasis on money efficiency and tax-free distribution strategies. We're going to get into that today. John's been recognized by num well, numerous times as being a top producer in the financial services industry, recently recognized by Forbes magazine as one of the top 250 financial security professionals in the United States with over a billion dollars. That's a, with a B, a billion dollars in enforce insurance for his clients. So I'm excited to have him here. In his free time, John enjoys hunting, fishing, golfing, camping, spending time with his wife, Maria, and their three children. John, thanks for joining me today. Hey, Neil, thanks for having me. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Well, it's, tell me, you got into, you know, working with dental professionals. And what did that look like your first few years in that industry? What did working with them look like? Um, you know, it, and I'll draw a parallel, you know, for for those of us in the day to day, you know, yeah. we'll call it grind, but the focus on the uh, real estate industry, there is a parallel. And that's this, you focused early on in your profession about who you serve what what your niche was so talk to me about that obviously it sounds like you stumbled into it but what did serving them look like yeah so let me let me just back up a little bit so yeah. i was i was a i was a teacher before i got into the business and i was a hockey coach and a teacher and i always had this dream of running my own business and being an entrepreneur and when my wife got in dental school uh, we had to move. And so therefore I didn't have a, a teaching job anymore. I had a coaching job, but I couldn't, the, the teaching jobs weren't available. So I was a head hockey coach and then I was teaching. And then my uncle who was in this business, um, you know, I went hunting one weekend and he just, he talked to me a lot about it. And I've always had, you know, I had an economics minor and I've always been intrigued by that. And I wanted to run my own business. And so that's kind of how I stumbled into the business. Um, and then with Maria going to dental school, it was just pretty natural to, you know, especially in the forms of disability, um, you know, with dentists and medical professionals, that, that's really key for them, right? So that became a real easy um, transition, I guess, just because understanding, you know, what she was going through, my father-in-law being a dentist, mm -hmm. um, even my sister being a doctor. So I spent my time doing that. But what's really interesting, though, is that my niche evolved, you know, from that to once I really understand it, understood uh, wealth and, and why traditional planning fails is what I, my niche is today is how we utilize a tax code to benefit you in retirement. Mm -hmm. And so that's basically where I focus today. But, you know, back to serving, you know, the, the medical professionals, um, you know, one of the things is they, they're, they're going 110 miles an hour, they're busy as all get out and they have right. massive amounts of debt. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so helping them understand, you know, how do you ensure that? How do you protect that? Because their biggest asset. So one of the things I talk to clients about is what's your biggest asset? What's your greatest asset? And I ask that question because I'm hoping the answer is themselves. Their, 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 right? ability, their, their ability to generate income. Yep. And, and your biggest same, asset. same in the real estate world. That's like right. We are, we are our greatest asset, right? Correct. So I ask that one of the questions that I always ask clients is what do you believe to be your greatest asset? And some people will say, well, my 401k or this yep. or that, or they think of it from an asset class, but no, we have to start to, to realize that we are our greatest assets. Mm -hmm. And once we can understand that, man, it, it just changes the paradigm shift of how you think about money, how you think about, you know, even ensuring certain aspects of your, your, your career and, and different things. So it was, you know, it was really eye opening um, during that time of my, uh, of my career, but it's really evolved into my niche now is just really utilizing the tax code to benefit the dental market, the medical market, and then in entrepreneurs and, and in the real estate space for sure. 
Yeah. Talk to me about the real estate space. Uh, there's, you know, I know a handful of people in the dental world. Some, some of my best friends are in that space. They real estate generally becomes a, um, a piece of what it is that they do. Dentists are a little different breed than traditional doctors in the sense mm -hmm. that most of them own their own practices. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they're a little, little more entrepreneurial from that, that perspective. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, and that's, what's interesting too, is that, you know, when the, when the dentists are going through dental school and then they get out, the thing I think that that's lacking in the education system, and I think you're going to probably agree with this, just in education or in general, is just the business and how to run a business, right? right? They get out from a practical standpoint, but there's not a lot of mm -hmm. um, time spent in, in dental school on how to run your practice. Correct. And so I think that's, you know, that's a really interesting fact too. So yeah, they, you know, they, they probably do have a little bit more entrepreneurial mindset. There is, you know, today with, with the way things are going from a medical perspective that where people are wanting to have their own private practice as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as it relates to real estate, you know, it, it is definitely an asset class. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, in our mastermind that we're in, right. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an easy um, thing to talk about because I think from a real estate perspective, it, it's tangible. You can see it, you can look at it in a lot of those cases. And it, and it, you know, from all the things that we hear about from a cash flow perspectives and things like that uh, can be, it can be efficient model. Yeah. You, you say that traditional planning is essentially broken. Expand mm -hmm. upon that. So if we look around, um, would you say, Tim, that most people are, Neil, sorry. You know? It happens all, it happens all the time. You don't, uh, don't worry. You know, I'm, um, I'll, I'll make uh, sure you write that check correctly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I was Tim. I was can, like, Tim, can, uh, can, you, can you tell I've said that once or twice? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, anyway, yeah. so I was thinking, I was thinking Tim and sorry. And yeah. anyways, the, um, mm -hmm. If we look at traditional planning from a perspective of microeconomics, it mm -hmm. becomes really micro. They'll typically look at just your 401k right. or where you're putting your mo money from a mutual funds perspective yeah. or average rate of return. The problem is, is that money's not micro, money's macro. And every financial decision that we could make affects all the decisions that we could have made. Mm -hmm. So Correct. to my point to you, Neil, Neil right, earlier was... Um, if we look around in the United States, are most people able to retire at the same standard of living that they had during their working careers? Would you say that's yes or no? No, it's, it's no. No, right? Now there's exceptions to the rule, true. Correct, and, and, but on and, average. But on average, right? No, that's not no. going to happen. And, and so if planning, traditional planning mm -hmm. was truly a science, Yep. and you could just average rate return your way into all these numbers or this, these assets people are supposed to have, then why doesn't it work? Right. And it's because they focus on a, a couple of things to where they're only focused on the accumulation model and rate of return, Correct. an average rate of return. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they also look at it from a microeconomic perspective. Again, yes. there is a direct correlation that if you're putting money into a 401k and how, you, and how you fund your mortgage, there's a direct correlation. And a lot of times we have people that have one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, and they don't understand that they're, they're, they're not helping themselves. Mm. Right. And so in our planning process, where we focus and spend our time is, is, is an area is called transfers of wealth, because we know that people are unknowingly and un unwillingly losing money to the institutions and the government every single day throughout their lifetime. And they're not even aware of it because the institutions and the government have made it their career to make sure we don't understand these areas of wealth transfers of how we can erode and lose our wealth. And it benefits them and not us. You're absolutely right. And, and real estate becomes a, a piece of that planning process and certainly one of, one of if not the greatest um, tax vehicle relative to accumulation. Yep. And the accumulation. And the, the challenge, though, is in the distribution part of it. Is yes. That you see, when you need it. When you need it, right? Because it's easy to depreciate or cross-segregate all these properties. But what happens is that people then get to the point to where there's no more depreciation. Correct. They have all this cash flow coming and then they become the perfect taxpayer. Yep. And so understanding that there's areas in the tax code, right, to where you can actually shelter, and shelter is probably the wrong word, but areas in the tax code to where you can actually utilize capital to where it's passive and it's, it's never going to be taxed again. Mm. And so those are the strategies in, in conjunction with utilizing real estate. So when we look at overall planning, we're always looking at areas of inefficiencies and wealth transfers. So how can we be more bulletproof in our overall plan? Right. And so it's, and we've identified over 37, I'm not going to get into 37, right. Yep. But we've identified 37 wealth transfers that people typically have or will have throughout their lifetime. Now it doesn't mean Neil that you'll have 37. You might just have yep. one or two. Yep. Okay? But so we spend our time 
plug in the leak, so to speak. And more importantly, I believe it's more important to avoid the losses than it is to pick the winners. Sure. So from a, from a traditional planning model, you know, when you sit down with an advisor, most of the conversations are how much money do you have? Where's it at? If you move it to me, I can get you a higher and better rate of return. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But when you move the assets over, you get a different sheet of paper, but it has the same asset class. It has the same rate of return. And who's taking all the risk with the money? You mm. are the advisor. You right. are. Right. Right. So I just don't, I just don't believe that that that's the most efficient way to grow wealth. And if you look around wealthy people and more importantly, banks are doing the exact opposite with their capital than they, what they tell us to do with it. Mm. So you got to sit back and start to wonder, are we just a pawn in the game? Or are we going to actually model what the institutions are doing to create wealth? It, it's completely different. Yeah. When you say wealth transfer, what to, for the audience to say, <laughs> you don't necessarily mean upon death, the transfer from, from you on to the next generation. That's not no. what we're talking about here. No, yeah. no, no. Right. So, I mean, so just a quick example, 60% yep. 60 of Americans today, 60% of Americans will lose a quarter of a million dollars worth of wealth in retirement because of the way the tax code is set up and where they have their assets positioned in retirement. So imagine, right, what rate of return would you have to get in some of your accumulated assets to recapture $250,000 loss? Right. It's almost impossible. But if you understand where those losses are coming from and are able to make decisions to redirect your capital so that it's avoided, that's a $250,000 gain with no risk. Right. Right. So, and that's just, in the, that's just in the tax code and it has to, it, ha and it follows along with social security. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's, there's a lot of things, you know, and another example is just how we put kids through school, the way the traditional model is set up for college planning. Now, whether or not you, you think that college is, you know, you want to put your kids through school. I know there's a lot of debate nowadays with where sure. things are going. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's always a topic of conversation is, is college planning. Right. But the way the institutions or the way the, the traditional model is, is that you, you put money into an account for 18 years. Mm -hmm. And when the kids go to school, you deploy, you deplete the account. And now you've forever lost that money. Right. And that is a major wealth transfer. And it's not just the cost of college that, that that's the loss. It's what that money would have earned for you had you never lost it in the first place, which could be millions of dollars. Sure. Right. So that those are just simple transfers of wealth. Right. And then it goes into how you how you structure mortgages, taxation insurance contract, all these different areas, right? And, and social security and distribution, safe withdrawal rates, all these different areas to where people are losing money and they're not even aware of it. Mm. So when people um, work with you, what does that look like? What do, what do initial conversations look like? And, and, and who's, who's best to connect with you? So initial conversations are really, it comes from a belief standpoint. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, everybody that I work with has to believe what I believe. Okay. They may not necessarily understand it, but they want to, they, they got to believe it right from to being as tax efficient as you possibly can be. Because from, from, if, if we don't have a common belief, I'm not a good fit. Right. And I'm not going to be the guy who's going to try to chase rates of return. Again, I believe in avoiding losses and finding lost money to be well, more efficient. Yeah. Right? I mean, the greatest single expense in anyone's life is our, our taxes. Exactly. Right. Greatest expense. Yeah. Yep. There's no and way so, around it. Yep. yep. And then, so it, you know, it, it comes down to the fundamental belief of number one, can I use the tax code to my advantage? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so initial conversations are to make sure that we believe in the same things, because if we don't have a common belief, no matter what I share with them from a planning perspective, we're just not a good fit. Right. And that's okay. I'm, I'm not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Um, and so we, we just go through that. And then we spend a lot of time talking about the difference between wealth and math and money. And helping them understand that I call it their BS, right? Their belief systems that things mm -hmm. that we have been taught to be true might not be true. Mm -hmm. um, and we help ex expand upon what we're taught and, and why those things are actually not true from an economic financial principle, from what the institutions tell us are true to why they're not true. Sure. Yeah, you know? especially especially when you come back to uh, talk about what the, the average rate of return and what that historically has looked like. And, you know, bonds make up any part of your portfolio. They've been terrible for a decade. They don't come close. There's a reason why pension funds all across the country are failing mm -hmm. because they cannot hit whatever target they put out there. Um, you know, have kids continued to, to fall short. Well, let me, and let me give, expand upon the, the average rate of return because in our industry, right. We're allowed to talk about average rates of return. Mm-hmm. And so let me give you a little bit of example of this. And, and for the viewers, you know, it might be hard because we're not drawing it out, but just so let's say in two years, I'm going to average you a guaranteed rate of 20%, mm -hmm. guaranteed average rate of return of 20%. All 
Are you led to believe you're going to have more money or less money? You're led to believe you have more money. Okay. So the investment's a hundred bucks, right? The first year we knock it out of the park, we have a hundred percent rate of return. So your hundred dollars now grows to 200. Mm -hmm. Okay. Year two, we start out with 200. We have an, uh Oh, we have an oopsie, right? We lose 60% in our mm -hmm. portfolio. So that's a $120 loss. Yep. Means now my 200 now is 80. $80. Now my guarantee to you was to have an average rate of return of 20%. True. True. Okay. So if I take a hundred, subtract that out by 60, that's 40 mm -hmm. divided by two, what's your average rate of return? 20%. And you end up with $80. Do you have more or less money? Got less. See, here's the difference. There is a huge difference between average rate of return and actual rate of return. Mm -hmm. I don't care what your average rate of return is. I only care what your actual rate of return is. If you look at all studies in history of, of indexes and all these things, the actual rate of return is always lower than the average. But yet our industry will throw these terms around like you average 8% or if you average 10%, you're going to have all this money. That's what I talked about earlier about why it's broken. Mm -hmm. If it was a science, it would work. But it, 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 it's not. It's an art. And you have to understand the nuances and the differences of when people are talking about if you average X amount of rate of return, it doesn't necessarily mean you can have more money. No. I just gave you a guaranteed average rate of return. I fulfilled my obligation and you have less. Correct. And it does not matter if the sequence of returns are different. So those are things that we help people understand that I, it's not, you, you can't average rate of return into wealth. You have to look at it from an opportunity perspective. And I think with a lot of business owners, when you look at people across the country who have made money, they've made money because they've had access to capital and they take advantage of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's how I believe that you can create wealth in this country. And it's having liquidity use control of your money. Yep. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. That and to your point, uh, what sounds like you do a really good job at is probably from your background is teaching, is educating people about it this. It, it is. I mean, so when I, when I, you know, that's why I brought that back up was, you know, when I first started my life, my adulthood, I was a teacher and I, I always wanted to be a business owner. I was like, if I can just take teaching and just teach it at a different level and educate at a different level, that's all we're doing. Right. I just, my, my job is to inform and educate and allow clients for the first time to make informed decisions without me telling them what to do. I think today the industry just tells people what to do, to do with their money and no and, and with no education, no supporting documentation, just the things that we thought we think are true, like average rate of return. It doesn't matter. Well, and, and you're so, right. It's it's often done through uh, very big, very large institutions as, as well. A lot of people with a lot of money and a lot of power, and uh, yeah. to get it from somebody who's who has to live it every day, like you, an independent business owner, it's just a, it, mm -hmm. it is a very different world. And you can have a you can challenge that, that belief. I don't want to say belief. I mean, challenge it with facts, right? <laughs> you just did, you just did the most, yeah. the most basic example and everybody watching this going, Oh my God, he's totally right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it, it is, it's, it's not, it's not my opinion, right? right. It's just economic truths. Correct. And if we sit back and look at what institutions, so banks, banks are in the business of making money. True. That's right. Fact. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fact. So why do we do the exact opposite with our money than what they do with their money? Right. It just, it's the definition of insanity, yeah, but yet, we, we, again, it, it comes back to the things that just are, we are bombarded with, correct. and the information we're bombarded with, who's, who's promoting the information? It's the government and the institutions, right? and they want all the control, just because it's, it's just nature, right? We just, we believe it, and we believe it as gospel truth, and yet it's not. Talk to me uh, about uh, how you work with uh, people in the real estate industry. A lot of people, myself and uh, my brethren, have a lot of real estate holdings, a lot of interest in that versus anywhere else, right? So talk to me about how, how that interacts uh, with you and how, how that uh, gets incorporated into the planning perspective. So yeah, so from a real estate perspective, right? We just have to, number one, understand the distribution side of it and what implications could be happening. And then to build strategies around that to where you can continue to buy more real estate mm -hmm. but then also have asset classes that are going to be tax exempt in distribution to mirror that. So one of the biggest things that we talk about in, 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 your, in this field is, is collateral, right? Mm -hmm. You guys understand collateral better than anybody or other people's money, right? But how do we utilize it and how can you build collateral to where you actually maintain and build 
the forward momentum and the compounding of your own money mm -hmm. versus the necessarily the equity or the appreciation of your properties, right? Because you don't own that equity. You don't own the equity in your properties. You have to get permission to get it, true? That's correct. Okay. So even though that's sometimes a big thing with, with real estate is look how much equity I have. Well, you don't own it, right? Can't you have to get it, permission you, to get it. You can't eat it either. No, you can't eat it either, right? Yeah, you can't eat it. But however, having that equity and the ability to use other people's money to go create other opportunities is yes. huge. So in, in the planning process, we just show you how to be more efficient and using other vehicles to help get more real estate, but then also have a, a place to park that capital to where you can use it tax exempt in retirement and or as the accumulation phase. Hmm. So, and then, and then the other thing that we look at is just how the properties are structured, right? Um, especially with where inflation is potentially going to head, right? Sure. Um, does it make sense to have your properties all paid off? Maybe, maybe not, right? We, we got to look at the economic principles around what we're trying to accomplish as it relates to the real estate market. But I think the biggest thing too, Neil, is just helping people understand the implications they're going to have from a tax perspective in distribution when all the depreciation is gone and they have all this money coming in. Mm -hmm. What is that going to look like? Correct. Because it can be nasty. It can be really nasty. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's, there's strategies from an estate planning strategy. There's all different <laughs> things that we can do to benefit and isolate from a, from a, from what I call the perfect taxpayer position yep. and becoming more efficient. Yeah. For the, for those who want to reach out, connect with you, uh, follow you, where would they, how do they do that? So I, uh, you can go to noplanningfee.com or johndwyer.me. Um, noplanningfee.com is a place just to go ahead and book a time with me and we can dig in and have a, a more detailed conversation. Um, johndwyer.me is just a little bit more about who I am. And again, you can also uh, click a time to visit with me there as yeah. well. But it gives you more insight of my background and what we believe. Perfect. We'll put those uh, links in the show notes here. I want to move on to our final segment, what I call four for impact. Your favorite quote, what is it? My favorite quote is, if what you thought to be true turned out not to be true, when would you want to know about it? When would you want to know about it? Who said it? My good buddy, Don Blanton. He's been a mentor of mine for many years. And I just, you know, it goes back. I say that, I say that constantly, day in and day out, right? If what we thought to be true turned out not to be true. And, and just look around what's happening just in, in the global sense. Like, what, look at what's happening right now, right? Are things really being are things really true that we're being told that maybe not we have to step back and, and we have to evaluate are they true or are they not correct if they're not true when do we want to know i want to know now i want to know <laughs> yesterday right <laughs> you know, right but, but neil like some people they they don't they want to put the don't. blinders on and the head in the sand they don't they don't want to know right and, and that's okay but for the people i interact with i want to be able to step back and, and be able to expose what is really the truth um yeah. Well, for those who, for, for those who follow us here in the, in the, in the show, we're, nobody wants to be a sheep. You want to be in control of your life, control your outcomes, control of everything. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think holds most investors back from hitting their next level, whatever their next level is? And let's say, I'm going to say in their personal business, not necessarily in, in accumulation, but in their personal business, real estate investors, what holds them back? I think sometimes, you know, it might, my answer might be a little bit differently, but I think emotion, mm. oftentimes we, we make decisions on emotion mm -hmm. and we let our emotions drive our decisions. And if you look at certain cycles in, in our history of economics, yeah. you know, it, we, we drive by how we feel today versus what is a long-term projection like. And by doing that, it, it oftentimes it makes us do decisions that we shouldn't have done right. and to where we either buy low right? Yeah. Sell high. Yeah. Right. Or, or, or do the inverse, right? Yeah. Inverse, yeah. Right? Yep. So leading, leading the, leading the um, emotion out of it. And that's hard, right? It's yeah. really hard to do that. And I think a lot of times we're, I mean, I've, I've done it, you know, and I'm in the business Sure. Yep. because we always look, we always want that, that instant gratification too, in these, these opportunities. And, right. You know, are we doing this for the long haul or what is really the strategy? And right. Just, leaving the emotion out of it. Yeah. What's the, in that, it, uh, it helps a lot to have it, the end in mind. You got to know. 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's what we talk to a lot of our, our clients about is we have to begin with the end in mind. We have right. to understand how the economic income streams are going to work to where you should start to position your assets. So you can begin with that end. 
right? And, and a lot of times traditional planning, they don't even talk about the end. They just talk about the, the, the accumulation model. Well, if you, do, if, you, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. That's right. It's true. Is that one of your favorite quotes? <laughs> <laughs> it is one of my favorites. Yeah, because uh, we always talk about that inside the business. What's what's the goal? What's the end? What's it look like? What's success look like? Where are we going? Where? What is the target? Because if you don't have it, what? I mean, just do anything. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. And so I think you know having having maybe a sounding board or a board mm -hmm. of advisors to help you make decisions, you know, in and outside of the business. Mm -hmm. um, having a coach um, that can really just give you an a different perspective because we do in the business out of the, we make decisions based on emotion all the time. And I think that that's kind of can, what creates the havoc. You know, in, in my world, from an investor standpoint, real estate investor standpoint, you know, I haven't gotten here without having plenty of advisors, plenty of coaches, plenty of training all along the way. And it sounds to me like the same is true for you in your business. 100%. Yeah. And that, that, um, that cuts across every business in my mind. You know, if, if Tiger Woods has a coach, mm. why don't I? Right. And I think, you know, that that's probably been the biggest thing for me is, is my journey is that I, I've invested in myself. You have to invest in yourself, right? Writing checks that make you sweat a little bit, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. And, and not from a risk perspective, but from an educational or investing. Correct. Your personal development, right? Personal development. Yes. Yep. And so being able to do that um, has really been the, the, the pivotal point in my career is when I started to realize I got to invest in myself. I got to, I got to take it to the next level. And it's not that I got to spend money to make money. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about true investment in personal business right. and development. And so by doing that, you know, one of the biggest things that's been drastically changed my, my office, my, my culture in the, in the company and in working with clients is just the mindset of abundance, right? Mm, yeah. Never that scarcity mode. Correct. Um, and just being able to just, you know, there's plenty of business out there. There's plenty of opportunity out there and there's plenty of people that we can help and um, give them financial freedom. And every conversation is an opportunity. That's right. And so if you have that mindset of abundance, I think that that really can serve you well as well. And I wouldn't have had that. Like I wouldn't have had that if I didn't invest in coaching in, in different things, right? Because it's one thing to say, but it's actually one thing to literally truly live by. To live, yes. You know, and if, and if you don't have people calling out your BS, your belief systems, mm -hmm. right? So yep. when you're not, when you're not fully operation, operating, operating that in that capacity, yes, you, you need those people in your life. Yep. Get back, get in the straight and narrow outside of your business. What are you most passionate about? You know, right now it's just because of the phase of our life. I mean, my, my sons, uh, and my, my son and my daughters are into figure skating and hockey. So we spend a lot of time at the rink, you yeah. know, I'm yep. back coaching him a little bit. So that is, and just, <clears throat> you know, just spending time with the family. I think, you know, it goes back to one of the things I've learned is that, yes, I've grown a, a successful planning practice, but at times it was at the risk of not spending time with the family. Right. You know? And so I think as I burned down my business and built it back up and looked at my vision and all the things that I want to accomplish, I'm really just really passionate about making sure I spend that those the time with my kids that I'll never get back. Right. You know? And interesting enough, when I've done that, my income rose funny enough. Right. What do you attribute that to? just following the vision, man. And just, you know, you can get more done in a day constraint versus if you have 15 hours to do something, right. Or two days to do something, you'll, you'll elongate and work longer. Work, hard, work, hard. work, work expands to fill the time. Yep. And so I think, you know, just knowing that I won't, you know, I don't meet after three o'clock. My schedule is, you know, I have four slots a day, potentially that I'll meet with clients. And then mm. that's the time I have. Um, you know, I, I, I don't meet people on weekends or after hours. I mean, we're, we're running a business, you know, you don't go to the dentist or the, or the dental doctor, you know, or meet them at the bar. Right. right. So we don't do that either. Right. You know? So it's just, it's just changing some of those, those, you know, mindsets, shifting yeah. the mind a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, your real question just been passionate about spending time with the family lately and enjoying the outdoors and, and doing what we can and traveling and trying to enjoy each other. It sounds like uh, hockey was a big piece of your life growing up. And then, you yeah. know, as you, as you got to be a young adult and then to pass that along and see, see the kids do it. Yeah. Hockey was, cool. hockey kept me out of trouble. <laughs> there is a commitment to that sport. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah. Last question. What's your favorite way to make an impact uh, on others with others in your community? You know, I think that the biggest impact for me is just realizing that, you know, 
we have a lot of things to be grateful for mm -hmm. and we're blessed and just being able to use our resources to benefit the people in our community and um, across the world. You know, we've done a lot of stuff in Haiti. Um, we're part of a lot of things. And I'm not saying this to be braggadocious, but I just think that's the impact is that we've been blessed. Mm -hmm. You got to give back. You got to give back, whether it's time, money, resources, whatever. And I think it's just recognizing that when people need help, help them. Yep. Um, you know, I think that is just the biggest thing. And, it, and it's not always easy, right? But I think um, my perspective is, is that, you know, I'm just some dumb knucklehead from North Dakota and I've been able to just, you know, have, you know, just an amazing life. And I want to, I want to give back in any way I can. And so we try to spend a lot of time doing that. That's tremendous. Well, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to, to connect up, get us, uh, get me in the schedule for us to have a conversation. Cause I think it's, um, your perspective is that, uh, that I think lines up super well with those who are, who are in real estate to begin with. A lot of us are in real estate for a whole bunch of reasons, but, um, control ownership, um, that, and, and, you know, and certainly my belief system is the traditional way, uh, probably didn't ever work. <laughs> Not that it's broken, probably didn't ever work. Right. Um, but it is, a, it is a path we've been pulled. And so to blaze your own, uh, your own, your own, your own way through real estate. And then at the same time, to have an understanding that taxes are so burdensome and you need to have proper planning, um, especially when it comes to the exit. You're right. People are, re, uh, the accumulation phase is just a different conversation. Uh, but when it comes to exit and how do you take distributions and how do we make sure we get the money out efficiently? It, it, you need, you need, you need to have some plan. Yep. The, the rules and the rule in the chain in the game changes 360 degrees. It is, it is not the same is accumulation and that's i mean that's a pretty easy part but the distribution models and the, all the things that we have facing us and that we're just not aware of that's where the art really comes into play yeah well I, thanks a ton john for for taking the time to connect up here we'll get the show notes here so for everybody um here at real grit i'm neil timmons reminding you that real estate requires real grit I'll see you next time. If you like our content and want more, you can access it at realgritpodcast.com. You hear it guest after guest. Instinctively, you already know it. But let me call it out. The most expensive action is inaction. The real estate market is full of opportunities. You just need to uncover them. You can build a business that lasts for years, makes monumental impact in the lives of those that you love. It's not just about business, but about the freedom you get because of it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I believe that partnering is essential. In fact, I partner with hardworking investors all the time. The point is that you can get a lot further with the right partner. Let me say it again, the right partner. If you've ever thought about partnering with anyone, or if you have a partner now, I encourage you to download my free partner and profit guide, which includes the top five must answer questions to evaluate a profitable partnership. You can find it at www.legacyimpactpartners.com. I'll see you in the next episode.